Hello, everyone. I'm Heath Fox, Executive Director of the La Jolla Historical Society. Welcome to the second of the La Jolla Landmark Group webinar series, La Jolla Landmarks 2020. This series brings together the researchers who prepared reports for homes that were historically designated by the City of San Diego Historical Resources Board during the 2020 calendar year. Curated by Shona MacArthur, Chair of the Society's Landmark Steering Committee, this two-part webinar series traces the architectural history of La Jolla from 1927 to 1987. In part one, we focused on pre-World War II homes in European historic styles. Tonight, in part two, we'll focus on post-World War II modern and postmodern designs. We'll see modern homes from the 1950s by Frederick Liebhardt and Sim Bruce Richards, and a postmodern design from 1987 by Henry Hester. And we'll hear from architectural historians Sari Johnson, Jennifer McDonald, and Wendy Tinsley Becker, along with the homeowners. The historians will present the story of the house and architects through a PowerPoint presentation. Following all three presentations, the owners and specialists will be available to answer your questions and provide additional commentary. A few details regarding this webinar. Please know that your microphone is muted and your video camera is turned off. If you have questions, please type them in the Q&A box. The questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar following the presentations. I would like to thank all of the presenters who participated in this project and say a special word of thanks to Meg Davis, who produced the series and who will be moderating the Q&A portion of the webinar. The Frederick and Marianne Liebhart House. Located in La Jolla Country Club Heights at the end of Carrizo Drive, the house is located in a heavily wooded area overlooking the Pacific Ocean. Designed in the organic geometric style of modern architecture, the house is cited to have a minimal footprint and profile, not blocking the gorgeous views of the ocean beyond. The organic, organic geometric style of architecture is important to San Diego's architectural history. Post-World War II is when several of the protégés from Frank Lloyd Wright's Fellowship of Taliesin West came to San Diego and established their own architectural firms. Frederick Liebhart is one of these protégés of Frank Lloyd Wright. He studied with Frank Lloyd Wright in Wisconsin at Taliesin and at Taliesin West. After World War II, he and his wife settled in San Diego, and this is the house that they built in 1951. What's unique about the house is that as a master architect designed residence, we get to see within his body of work what he would choose for himself. And we get his unpolluted <laughs> design ideas in his own house, being that he was his own client. This Julius Shulman photograph shows what it looked like in the 1970s, and it still has the same integrity today. The original 1951 building construction is very typical wood post and beam structure on a concrete slab on grade. The 1969 edition, also designed and built by Frederick and Mary Ann Liebhart, is typical wood post and beam structure on a raised foundation with a continuous concrete perimeter footing and interior spot footings. The house demonstrates many character defining features of this organic geometric style, site-specific design, asymmetrical facades, exposed structure, and extensive views of wood, glass, and stone. The house is important and historically designated under two criteria. Criteria C for its organic geometric style of architecture, 
and Criteria D as the notable work of master architect Frederick Charles Liebhardt. The Liebharts purchased the property in 1950 from Kessling Modern Structures, Inc. Kessling is another one of San Diego's master architects. The Liebhart family lived in the house from 1951 to 1957. When they moved to another property that they owned, they rented the house from 1958 to 1969. They came back and designed the addition to the house in 1969 to 1970. And so the Liebharts lived in the house from 1970 until Fred died in 1999 and Marianne in 2014. Frederick Liebhart was born in Fresno on May 28, 1924, and grew up in San Marino and Pasadena. Prior to World War II, Liebhart attended Curtis Wright Technical School and worked briefly on aircraft engineering. When he attended the fellowship of Taliesin West with Frank Lloyd Wright, he and Mimi and at least one of their two kids lived, lived on site with them. When they came to San Diego, the Liebharts had two children, and so this was a family home. You can see this Julia Schulman photograph and on the left, and then what the Liebharts designed on the right when they remodeled, after they remodeled the entryway. You can see the corner glass, the use of stone, and the very dramatic roof lines. Being that Liebhart worked in the aerospace industry, aeronautic industry, you can see this very interesting roof line, kind of like the wings of a plane that come together at a center point. Here's the original front entry and the side of the house. This bathroom window is in an enclosure so you have privacy and light coming into the bathroom. You can see the repeating details of the structure on this side of the house. As the Liebharts lived in the house over a long period of time, there's a lot of modifications that they did. You can see with the spines coming out of the house that are part of the structure, we have wood members that provide shading for the, for the windows that protect from the morning sun. Here you can see the pattern detail on the wall that the shade structure provides. The house is a U shape around a central courtyard. Again, you can see the roof structure with the wings, kind of like an airplane. The light fixtures you can see on this porch are hand, probably hand built by Fred Liebhart or his craftsman, definitely designed by the Liebharts. Um, Mary Ann Liebhart also had a background in interior design, and so we can, we can safely assume that a lot of the features, lighting design, interior features, were heavily influenced by her background as well. This is a great photo by Julia Schulman that shows, to me, the absolute best view of the house. And then what it looks like today. The current owners have been breathing new life into the house, retaining its original character and features. Here is the three fireplaces on the interior. The chimneys on the outside of the glass. And the sliding glass doors, clerestory windows that just bring lots of light and proper airflow throughout the house.
This is a neat photograph showing up on the hillside. Fred Liebhart had his studio. Um, he would work inside the house, but he would take his work up to this little studio that he built at the top of this hillside, and he could just overlook the ocean. He had some sort of canvas awning type roofing, and he would just work out in the open air. Absolutely fantastic feature to the site. And of course, the materials are gorgeous. The wood, the stone, the concrete work. You can see the board forms around the stones on the concrete work, and then some of the tile work. The house overlooks the Pacific Ocean and is sited so beautifully. It's an absolutely magical place. Thank you for this opportunity to present the Frederick and Marianne Liebhart House in La Jolla, California. Thank you, Sari. We appreciate this look at Fred Liebhart's great example of modern architecture. Next up is Wendy Tinsley Becker and the Schmock House by Sim Bruce Richards. Hello, everyone. My name is Wendy Tinsley Becker. I'm principal of Urbana Preservation and Planning, LLC. So welcome to Historical Resources Board number 1370, the Lieutenant Commander Donald and Major Joyce Schmock Residence, designed by architect Sim Bruce Richards. The property is located at 7345 Remley Place in La Jolla, um, which is up in the Country Club Heights tract. Uh, HRB number 1370 um, was actually designed and constructed under two separate campaigns, the first in 1952 and 1953, and again in 1961 through 1970, excuse me, 63, um, all designed by Sim Bruce Richards. The home is still owned by uh, the Schmock family today, uh, by Jonathan Schmock, um, son of Donald and Joyce Schmock. The property was designated or is designated under Historical Resources Board Criterion C for a uh, representation of the organic geometric style. It's also designated under Criterion D for representing the work of master architect Sim Bruce Richards. So a little bit about the Schmock family. Um, Lieutenant Commander Donald Schmock, who was also an attorney, was a native of Iowa, and he arrived in Southern California to attend college um, in Los Angeles. He later joined the United States Navy from 1942 to 1946, and then attended Cal Western School of Law in the 1950s. Uh, and then ultimately, remained associated with the United States Navy um, via the Naval Reserve, uh, where he achieved rank of Lieutenant Commander um, and became a United States Commissioner in 1967. Unfortunately, he passed away in 1968. His wife, Joyce, was really a remarkable woman. And when we were designating the property, we had actually asserted the house as being significant under Criterion B for association with Joyce Schmuck who we asserted as an important person in San Diego history. Um, she's a native San Diegan, born in 1920, and graduated from the Teachers Training College, San Diego State College, in 1941. Uh, Joyce was one of just a small handful of women in San Diego who joined the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps uh, in 1942. Uh, she remained with the Corps through 1956 um, and ultimately achieved the rank of major. Um, in 1947, Donald and Joyce married to receive a doctorate in education from UCLA. Um, so she had this whole kind of second life uh, where she became a professor of education at San Diego State University in the 1960s and through the mid-70s. Um, what we found is that Joyce really was like this innovative and independent and powerful woman. So in the early 1950s, the Schmocks hired architect and artist Sim Bruce Richards to design their new home. And, you know, I, I don't know how they came to know one another, but what I do find that in the mid-century period, we tend to see an association between academics and artists. Uh, Bruce Richards was born in 1908 in Oklahoma, and his family actually moved to Phoenix in 1920, so right at the start of that massive influx of westward migration that the country experienced um, in the 1920s and into the 1930s as part of the Dust Bowl. 
He took an early interest in art and weaving in particular, studying under local artists who later would become regarded as master weavers. And ultimately, he attended college at, um, at Cal at UC Berkeley. Um, he started off in the architecture department and ultimately, again, always veered back to art, transferred over to the art department. Um, he was affiliated with the university between 1930 and 1934. Um, soon after graduating, he uh, relocated back to Arizona for a short period of time to become a um, fellow or an apprentice um, at Taliesin West. Um, of course, the famed Taliesin West, the, the Western home of Frank Lloyd Wright, uh, where he um, continued his fellowship and apprenticeship program. In 1938, he relocated to San Diego, and soon thereafter, he married Janet Hopkins. The couple resided primarily in Point Loma, um, with Bruce designing several of their personal residences, including properties located at 977 Albion Street, uh, and that is pending designation currently at 3360 Harborview Drive, which is designated as Historical Resources Board number 940, excuse me, 944, and at 955 Banger Street. He passed away in 1983, but prior to that, he maintained a, a solid 40-year career in art and architecture. Between 1941 and 1945, he served as a civilian architect for the United States Navy. Uh, for two years thereafter, he served uh, uh, or rather worked in the office of William Templeton Johnson, who's also a master architect. Uh, and then he broke off into his own, essentially holding an independent architectural firm in practice from 1948 to 1983 until his death. Uh, he maintained offices first in La Jolla on La Jolla Boulevard on Pearl Street office was located at 800 Pearl Street, um, no longer extant, and then also on Prospect. Ultimately, he relocated his office to uh, Old Town on Linwood Street. Simbers Richards was a professional. He was elected as president of the San Diego chapter of the American Institute of Architects, and he worked with and employed other artists, including James Hubble, Ken Kellogg, a noted master architect, as well as Spencer Lake. So he really um, is characterized for this modernist aesthetic or a subtype called the organic geometric style. And the Remley Place property is defined as an organic geometric style home. Um, the or organic geometric style is a subtype of the larger modernist aesthetic. Um, it was popular, popularized generally from 1950 until about 1975. The, the aesthetic or the style often incorporated natural materials like wood and stone, um, always a lot of glass, as you can see in some of the examples here. And then the form of the buildings was characterized by rectilinear geometry, asymmetrical volumes, and angular shapes and roof lines. So um, these are all buildings on the screen designed by Simbrus Richards, and you can see the angular characteristics, um, the use of um, wood with monochromatic facades, um, the geometric forms, as well as the, the angular and rectilinear um, combined. Okay, so launching into 7345 Remley Place, um, the schmucks, uh, you know, they, they knew what they had, right? And look at, they were able to um, retain and frame and preserve the original illustration for the property. Um, this actually dates to circa 1952. And you are able to compare this exactly to what was built and see how pretty spot on it was. Okay, so we have construction photos from the original construction campaign. You can see here that we have wood framing um, in the upper left with cantilevered elements over the original brick wall base. And then in the center and to the right, we actually have historic views of Donald and Joyce, you know, out there um, exploring their new job site and their family home. 1952-53 campaign, here we, here we have the property uh, construction is complete and kind of the finished product from the original design. We see horizontal board siding, expansive um, fixed and operable glass windows. Um, you can see the uh, brick foundation walls there um, behind Donald and his vehicle parked on the hill at the street, uh, as well as behind uh, Joyce holding her newborn son, Jonathan. 
into 1961. So at some point, the parents decided that they needed additional space or were ready for a change. And they again contacted Bruce uh, to identify, um, you know, how, how the home could be further developed. Jonathan Schmock will tell you is that he recalls as a child playing on the floor of, of Bruce's architectural office, playing with toys while, you know, his mother and the architect would talk about um, art and design and the, the second campaign for their property. So here's the 1961 sketch illustration um, for the second campaign. We can see that the project intended to um, extend out from that north or northwest facing elevation um, that's pictured here to construct a garage and a roof deck. So the central photo, the larger view, is that cantilevered element being deconstructed to then uh, further construct. Um, over on the left, we see the garage being constructed, um, single story, rectilinear volume, two car garage, you know, fairly, fairly kind of basic um, volume, but consistent with and compatible with the rest of the house. And all uh, the horizontal board siding continues, um, the use of brick is retained, um, and most of the original features of the building were retained as part of this second campaign. And when we're talking about modernist architecture, we also need to acknowledge the interior aspects of the building. Sim Bruce Richards, like a lot of modernists, also designed fireplaces and furniture and other aspects um, or interior finishes and fixtures. We see sculptural chandeliers um, and fireplaces that are character defining and that are attributed to Bruce um, in the property. Um, the property is also notable because there's actually bathrooms designed by James Hubble. Um, the home has bathroom tiles, beautiful artistic ceramic tile work um, designed by James Hubble. And then finally, you're looking at a 1964 historic photo. Uh, master photographer Julius Schulman photographed the property in that mid-1960s period. So the next grouping of slides leads you into current photos. Um, you can see the dashed line in the center of the image. Um, to the right side of that dashed line is the original volume that was pictured in historic photos and that was in the original drawings. Um, and to the left side is the 1961 construction campaign, which resulted in the roof deck atop um, the new garage. Um, so it was actually a quite seamless um, addition. And, and of course, we would attribute that to the fact that the same architect, Sim Bruce Richards, you know, constructed or, excuse me, supervised the design um, and construction of, of both campaigns. So this is the west elevation with brick base and horizontal, excuse me, uh, vertical siding, fixed and operable glazing, um, all with northwesterly views. Um, the mature pine tree was actually planted by the Schmocks as part of the original construction campaign. And if you peek into the window there at the left side of the photo, you can see another sculptural chandelier. This is the south elevation with board siding, multi-plane roof lines, single light wood doors, clear story windows, and aluminum windows, all original. South elevation courtyard with single light entry doors, board siding, uh, and then aluminum units installed as part of the 1961-1963 campaign um, with an original side door and jealousy windows. And then the 61 to 63 garage and roof deck addition um, with railing that was recently reconstructed consistent with Sim Bruce Richards' original specifications. Um, the property owner went through an extensive design review process with the city of San Diego to uh, build that railing according to original specifications. And then of course the north elevation which faces towards the, the Pacific Ocean, uh, additional board siding, aluminum slider units, and the roof deck atop the board form stem wall. And then we see the upper level of the north elevation, the roof deck. So you can see that historic era home kind of punctuating every historic photo of the subject property uh, prominently placed there at the rear to take advantage of those westerly views. This is the north elevation, second level, northeast corner with full height glazing, uh, extended eaves, and that mid-level canopy uh, that, that wraps uh, certain facades. And then the rear part of the home, it's actually really difficult to photograph because it's located on a canyon. So, but you see the same monochromatic vertical wood siding, the same uh, full height wide windows um, with fixed and jealousy units. 
Where are we now with this property? Well, as I stated in 2018, the property underwent rehabilitation, uh, really focused on that garage and on the original railing. And the property owner, again, was lucky enough to have this great childhood photo that you see here to the right that helped to inform um, the review process with the city of San Diego and those specifications for the railing. You know, this isn't railing that would be otherwise approved today. Um, so the railing was reconstructed in 2018. Um, you know, one of the things that we see time and time again about buildings like this is that typically when you have a home that is maintained by a single person or a single family uh, throughout its lifetime, that property tends to remain highly intact. And that's the thing that most preservationists want. We want to see these homes highly intact. Um, it means that they have enough integrity to convey their significance. We have to continue to give a nod to Major Joyce Schmock. And although the property is not designated for an association with her, we, we all really acknowledge the fact that she was clearly a powerhouse of a woman in the mid-century. She was, you know, a major in the Women's Auxiliary Corps. She was an educator with a doctorate degree, and, and, um, and, and it's clear she was an accomplished person. Um, she was also clearly a supporter of arts and architecture and established a legacy of design appreciation that her son is, is maintaining today. Um, through programs like this and through allowing the building to be designated. Again, my name is Wendy and I'm available if you have any questions or comments and uh, Mr. Schmock will be joining us for the question and answer session. So thank you so much. I hope you've enjoyed the presentation. Thank you, Wendy, for showing us this wonderful modern home. Now we'll take a look at a postmodern design presented by Jennifer McDonald. My name is Jennifer McDonald, and I'll be discussing tonight the history and context for the Helen K. Copley Henry Hester House at 7932 Prospect Place. I am a preservation architect here in San Diego, and I am partnered with Paul and Sari Johnson of Johnson Johnson Architecture. Uh, we were blessed to be commissioned by owners uh, Eberhard and Jessica Rome to research and nominate their property at 7932 Prospect Place. Uh, we successfully petitioned the City of San Diego Historical Resources Board in October of last year, and the house is now designated as Historical Resource 1390. As you are all probably aware, there are several criteria by which a house may be designated, um, and it only takes one to meet the threshold. However, we were able to have this house designated under two criteria. Uh, the first is Criterion C. The house is a good example of the neo-eclectic French mansard style of postmodern architecture. Uh, I was tasked with writing the statement of significance for this criteria, and it was a very exciting challenge because this house is unique amongst not only Johnson & Johnson's body of work, but really amongst the entire body of work that goes before the board. And this property was also eligible under Criterion D as a notable work of master architect Henry Hartwell Hester. To orient you and give you some context, the site is located on Prospect Place, about a block and a half from Torrey Pines Road. Uh, faces north with lovely views out over La Jolla Bay. A closer view of the site, the house we are discussing tonight is the property outlined in red to the right, 7932. But I do want to point out the property immediately adjacent to the west, outlined in dashed red. That is 7934 Prospect Place, which is the sister property to ours, which was also designed and built at the same time for the same owner as a pair. As you can see, the lots are very long and narrow, but ultimately what makes the site such a lovely private oasis amongst the bustle of La Jolla. The two sites were purchased in 1985 by prominent California newspaper publisher, Helen Kenny Copley. She was also a noted philanthropist and served in leadership positions of a staggering amount of organizations throughout her career. Um, she was a mover and a shaker here in San Diego, to say the least. Copley lived nearby in La Jolla and purchased the property to build two guest houses. She never lived at the property, which is why the property is not designated under Criterion B for an association with important persons. Now, before I dive into the property itself, I want to give a quick primer on the state of architecture at the time the house was designed. I think in order to understand and appreciate the design, it needs some context. Western architecture pre-1920 was largely dominated by revival styles from the nostalgic past. They relied heavily on ornamentation and manual labor and craftsmanship. These styles were eclectic in nature, often blending eras and styles. 
Around 1920, modernism emerged in Europe as a coordinated movement in the wake of World War I. Now, those of us familiar with San Diego architectural history know that the likes of Irving Gill and his colleagues were already going down the path of what would become modernism well before 1920. But as a wide-scale force to be reckoned with, it didn't take off until the European movement came about after post in the post-World War I era. Um, there was an emphasis on using the latest building technology and materials. It spun into numerous subtypes, but the rejection of ornament and historical precedent remained consistent throughout the various expressions. Postmodernism came about starting around 1960. While the seeds of postmodernism had been sown throughout the 1950s, it really didn't become a movement until about 1960. Theorists and practitioners began to advocate for looking back to history for inspiration and to get away from the alienating sterility of modernism. They advocated for eclecticism and not dogmatic revivalism. Um, the only thing they did carry over from modernism was a devotion to form over ornament. Postmodernism continued to grow throughout the 1970s, but what I would call high postmodernism, the grandest of its expressions, really peaked in the 1980s. It was a style primarily seen on public architecture and was rare in residential design. Similar to the 16th century Baroque mannerism, experimentation with scale, rhythm, and tectonics were at its core. Um, it was about complexity and contradiction rather than simplification, but the overall materiality tended to be simplified. And San Diego is home to a few notable textbook examples. Circling back to the topic at hand, Henlon Copley purchased the property in 1985 in the heyday of high postmodernism. In 1986, she persuaded noted retired architect Henry Hartwell Hester to design the houses for her. And in 1987, she commissioned R.E. Hazard Jr. as general contractor to build the structure. Um, the Hazard family have a long history of building um, important sites throughout San Diego. Henry Hartwell Hester is uh, recognized by the city of San Diego as a master architect because of his growth and contributions to the world of architecture throughout his 30 plus year career. Uh, Hester was raised in San Diego and after serving in the Coast Guard in World War II, graduated from the University of Southern California School of Architecture in 1952. He then promptly earned his architect license in 1953 and then opened his first practice in 1954. His prime career period spanned uh, the 1950s and the 1960s, during which he received awards and publications. Having achieved quite a bit of success, he then took a step back, focusing on lower profile high quality projects throughout the 1970s before retiring to spend time with friends and family in 1983. His career is notable for work across the spectrum, including custom residential, luxury apartments, and commercial building. These are a sampling of Hester's custom residential projects to give you context for his work previous to the prospect place guest houses. Two on the left are from the 1950s. Um, these are clearly modern structures with several character defining features, including Exposed post and beam structure, uh, low single story uh, structures with horizontal emphasis, overhanging eaves with flat roofs, large expanses of glass that blur the lines between the indoors and out. Hester was very big into integrating engineering and landscaping and architecture into a, a whole design. The images to the right demonstrate his work going into the 1960s. Still clearly modern, but there is a more emphasis on form. Uh, more play between solid and glass. He uses the glass strategically rather than walls of glass. Um, but overall, the clear connection is a clean modern design with no reference to history. Um, note the house in the lower right corner is 7930 Prospect Place. Uh, sits immediately adjacent to our project site, um, sharing a property line with uh, 7932. Now, I don't know for sure how it came to be that Helen Copley asked Hester specifically to come out of retirement to design her houses. But if she knew he designed 7930, it would make sense to me why she would turn to him to design these houses. The houses were intended for guests and the density of the neighborhood is such that adequate on-site parking was a must. By this point, the coastal height limit was in full effect. And so it required strategic design to access views without exceeding the high limit. And unfortunately, the existing development across Prospect Place impedes any ground and lower level ocean access views. The resulting design is a collaboration between Copley and Hester. Where the lines fall exactly, we don't know, but what we do know is that Copley specifically requested that copper mansard roof line. This shifts the design away from the clearly modern work he'd been doing previously. And photos of his later work are hard to find, but from what I can tell, um, this project in his retirement phase is unique, um, and that is clearly postmodern. 
and features a play of elements seen in high postmodernism. Um, that in itself is a rarity, as high postmodernism is mostly a public architecture form. So before we go a little further, I do have a little bit more context to share. Residential design at the time that this house was done was in the neo-eclectic phase, um, which had become the dominant form of residential design by 1970, for both custom and speculative tract housing. The optimism of the post-World War II era um, that brought in modernism had really dulled in the wake of the Vietnam War. And people were looking for a little bit more history and comfortability with the known. Um, a number of neo substyles developed based on earlier pre World War II revivals. And to this day, speculative suburban residential and commercial architecture are still in this era. Um, the one that is important to our discussion is the neo French and its subtype, the mansard. So the origins of the mansard style in the late 20th century dates to 19th century Paris. Uh, throughout the 1850s and the 1860s, Paris underwent a major coordinated urban redevelopment that produced a cohesive, attractive streetscape that Paris is famous for to this day. These streetscapes with commercial uses below and multi-story townhouses above then inspired contemporary American architects and builders. Soon the fervor took off across the states in what became known as the Second Empire style. It was both a mix of direct imitation and creative license. The key features for our discussion, the double pitched mansard roof, either convex or concave. The mansard roof, uh, which we can see in the photo here, um, was developed in the 17th century by French architect Francois Mansart. The roof allowed a visual material change from the wall material to the roof material or providing adequate space for an additional story within. The need for light and air within that extra story then leads to the characteristic dormer windows that we see here. Ornate black wrought iron railings called balconettes are probably the second most iconic elements after the roof line. The small balconies were intended to hang flower pots to further elevate the streetscape. And then multi-light windows are very tall and slender. True French windows are swinging casement style that nearly touch the floor such that they are effectively doors. The mansard style that developed during the neo-eclectic period often began and ended with the mansard roof. It became a popular roof line with commercial as well as residential architecture because builders and designers liked the roof and its design possibilities. But the other elements typical of French architecture were not really important and didn't typically um, be included in the design. So Hester's design at 793 Prospect really stands out. He designed a whole neo-French package. A general overview of the project is that Hester stacks three stories into a narrow shotgun layout. The photo you see here is the street facing front of the house. It's very narrow. At the ground level is the ground floor entry, as well as the garage, which is obscured from this view, but you can just see the garage doors at the lower edge of the photo. Um, level one are the bedrooms, and then level two is the common living spaces. Windows and outdoor living areas are oriented to not easily be seen by neighbors or passers-by, and the overall design is a rare example of high postmodern neoclectic residential design that uses the mannerist play of scale and precedent in conjunction with key Hester features um, that he developed earlier in her career. So at the front, we have a multi-story vertical orientation. We have that distinctive copper mansard roof with concave curve. There's balconettes on both living levels with simplified black metal railings. And then there's tall, uh, multi-light French doors inspired by French windows. So another view of the front, this time with the garage. Here we can see the garage doors, which are underemphasized, um, which is appropriate because, of course, garages are not part of the Paris streetscape. We also see a number of Hester's own defining features. Integration of indoor-outdoor living by making those balconettes functional balconies with views to the ocean. Entries and windows are oriented for privacy. As you can see, there's no front door on the house here. And then these plus-shaped columns, I spotted them in some of his earlier work. I don't know the frequency with which he used them, but this is definitely not the first time they show up. All right, moving to the west side, uh, which is the only side elevation that's even remotely visible. We see, once again, we maintain a multi-story vertical orientation. There's a heightened scale of the mansard shifts. It's a little hard to see, but above the window is the smaller mansard that's on the front of the house, and then it deepens to take up the entire second floor as it goes across the rest. The tall multi-light French windows um, nearly touch the floor and are clearly inspired by actual French windows. 
Moving a little bit closer, we see an integration of the landscape, even in tight conditions, which is a typical feature of uh, Hester's earlier design. Entry is oriented for privacy. Um, it's completely concealed from the street, and neighbors have no visual access into the site as well. He uses the landscaping and the site walls to block. Uh, moving even a little bit closer, we can clearly see one of the French windows again um, that goes down to the, nearly the floor. We can see a little bit further in the back of the image, um, a little bit of the through the cornice window, which we'll see a better picture of in just a minute, uh, which is another character defining feature of the neo French Manstard style. And then here we have the front door, which features a full light and leaves the entire entry fully visible. Um, but because of the privacy Hester created, it's not uncomfortable in the way it would be if it was on the front of the house or directly facing the street. So the mansard at this location fully engulfs the second floor and features a through the cornice window. So this is a common feature of neo-French mansard designs where a stacked window arrangement cuts into the mansard from the wall below. It's a play on the dormer windows common in actual French mansard roofs. Um, and here Hester plays with the scale and exaggerates it a bit. Um, he also exaggerates the window muntins and the styles as they are bolder than their true French counterparts. Here we are at the rear. Uh, the grade at this location is higher, so we only see the first and second floors. The ground level is concealed, buried in the earth. Um, we see another through the cornice window. Um, this time the physical size has been reduced as it's on a much narrower wall, but the scale comparatively is even more exaggerated. Um, here's a nice shot of those French windows um, at the guest bedroom. You can clearly see that they practically touch the floor, becoming more doors than windows. And there's a, another set stacked above. Um, nearly touching the floor at the, uh, the interior space in the living level. And then finally, here we have a circular staircase that accesses a balcony off the second floor, um, providing a functional outdoor space at both levels. Um, the balcony creates a cozy covered patio below, um, and he uses the same balcony railing from the front of the house um, that is echoed here. And this is a very small little backyard space, but he really creates this nice, almost reminds me of like the little pocket parks in New York City. I would like to thank Sean MacArthur and the La Jolla Historical Society for asking me to participate in this event. I'd also like to thank Eberhard and Jessica Rome for being amazingly enthusiastic stewards of this property. And of course, Paul and Sari Johnson for bringing me into their circle. Thank you, Jennifer, for sharing the background of this terrific late career Henry Hester home. We're now going to transition to the Q&A with owners and specialists. So please type your questions into the chat and we'll try to address some of your concerns. Thank you, Heath. And now I'd like to invite our panelists and our homeowners to turn on their cameras and their microphones for the Q&A part of our program. And if you haven't already, you can type in a question into that Q&A box for any of our presenters or homeowners, and we'll try and answer as many questions as we can. But before we start our Q&A, I'd like to reintroduce our presenters and introduce our homeowners that are with us today. For the Frederick Liebart House on Carrizo Drive, Sari Johnson was our presenter, and our owners are Paul Basil and Jules Wilson. For the Sim Richards House, on Revley Place, Wendy Tinsley Becker was our presenter, and the owner is Jonathan Schmock. And the Henry Hester House on Prospect Place, Jennifer McDonald was our presenter, and the owners are Jessica and Eberhard Rome. But before we start the Q&A, our La Jolla Landmarks Chair, Shona MacArthur, would like to say a few words. Thank you, Meg. This is the first time the Historical Society has presented a webinar <clears throat> on recently designated historic landmarks. The reasons it is possible to do this are many. Number one is probably because of the, of the pandemic. We're all a little used to using Zoom, and so we weren't too frightened to do something like this. <clears throat> also because we had Meg to help us, that was very critical indeed. Um, I wanted to just talk about how the idea came about because um, it's, it's actually interesting for you to know that the, the whole idea of doing this series was because of the enthusiasm and extreme detail that the researchers put into each of the reports that makes the designation possible. 
And I had heard Sari Johnson speak on the Liebhardt's house. And she spoke with such uh, authority and enthusiasm, I thought, and the, and the research of her report and the re other reports that I've seen are so incredibly in depth and mm -hmm. thorough. I thought we really need to share this information with the public rather than it just going to the city officials. So I really wanna thank them again. Um, they volunteered their time to share this information with the public. And um, I'm very grateful. We're all grateful that you've come forward to help us tonight and, um, and the homeowners as well. And that's all. Thank you again. Thank you, Shona. Okay, we have a lot of questions to get through here. So the first one that has come in is what other structures did Fred Liebhardt design in La Jolla or San Diego? Would any of our specialists like to take that on? <laughs> this is Sari. Um, so Fred Liebhardt did quite a few buildings at UCSD, including um, um, one of the buildings at the gymnasium, um, the Scripps Library. He did some projects for the Bishop School, um, several projects in Mission Bay, Islandia Hotel, lots of residences. Um, he, there's over 300, let me see, 168 individual projects that we um, identified. And of course, we didn't, it's just never enough time to talk about Frederick Liebhardt. <laughs> so, um, He's pretty iconic. When you go through his list, you you have definitely seen quite a few of his projects in La Jolla. Great. Anyone else want to comment on that? Okay, very good. Um, so another question we have is, can you explain the local historic designation process? And uh, Wendy, I thought maybe we could start with you on that one. Sure. Um, so the local designation process um, involves uh, applying for eligibility under one of several criteria. Essentially, the local register, the City of San Diego Register of Historical Resources, is modeled after our National Register of Historic Places, but then expanded. Uh, so essentially, a property can be found eligible for an association with an important um, event um, an important person uh, for representing a specific style of architecture or embodying the distinctive characteristics of a particular style, period, or method of construction or work of a master. Um, and then also there are other um, eligibility criteria that relate to historic district, um, contributor status, if something is listed on the National Register of Historic Places already. Um, so the first step is to begin to explore your property, conduct research. Um, research can be a little challenging right now for some property owners and even for some consultants, but I think after a year, everyone has it down still. Uh, so you can do archival research at the San Diego History Center, at, obviously at the La Jolla Historical Society um, for La Jolla Properties. Uh, at the San Diego Library History Room, and then also reach out to the city of San Diego um, to identify if there's anything available. The city maintains a database called the California Register of Historical Resources Database, the CRID. Uh, so you can actually look up contextual information on other uh, properties of a similar style of architecture, other buildings that are designed by that particular architect or constructed by that particular builder, like you know, Sari reference, you can find other Frederick Lee Park buildings um, if they've been designated or surveyed. Um, so you put together a report called a historical resource research report, um, and you fill out these technical forms that we all use in the state of California called Department of Parks and Recreation, DPR 523 forms. Um, and you fill that out and you submit it to the city of San Diego and you wait. And um, sometimes the wait is uh, longer than other periods. We're in a, a long wait period now, but um, I believe city staff is bringing on more staff members. So hopefully that will, um, you know, improve uh, more through time. Um, ultimately, the property is agendized for a historic resources board meeting and uh, property owners have an opportunity to uh, present an overview kind of like what we've done here to the board. Um, and, you know, hopefully your property is designated, which then means in the next year, um, if you'd like, in the next calendar year, you can apply for the Mills Act, which then provides that property tax abatement on an annual basis. 
So it's, you know, it's, um, I, I always encourage property owners to explore self-designation if they have the time and kind of the ability. Um, and there are a lot of great consultants in town that you can also work with. Great, right. thank you, Wendy. And would any of our other specialists like to add anything to that? <laughs> Okay, uh, so the next question that's come in, uh, I think is applicable for all of our homeowners. And the question is, why did you decide to apply for historic designation? And I thought maybe we could start with Jonathan first. Hi everybody, wherever you are. Um, I'm Jonathan Schmock. My parents um, built this house, the Sim Bruce Richards house on Remley. And Getting it designated was always a goal of my mom's. She always wanted to do it. And uh, it's one of those things, oh yeah, someday I'll do that. And uh, in Wendy's presentation, she showed how we had to redo the deck because a, a wooden house is kind of like a, like a boat that just sits there. You know, it doesn't, it, it always needs to be redone. And the deck was leaking, the deck had to go, the railing had to go and it had to be rebuilt. And um, so I had an architect help me um, not screw it up uh, named Robert Thiel, who was very instrumental and who worked with Bruce in his early yeah. career. And uh, of course it's like, well, we can't do what was there because it's not up to code. So we went to the city, that place, wherever it is downtown in the building. <laughs> And uh, he uh, and he said, you know, because you can't put an eight-inch ball, and it has to be high, and 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 uh, to to plead our case. And this is true. It was on Halloween day, so we were pleading our case to a vampire and a kitty cat. You know, <laughs> but it was it's true. And I took this picture that Wendy showed of that's me on the railing and they looked at each other and they said, we want that. And we said, well, we can't do that. Your office says we can't do that. And they looked at each other and they said, oh, that's Camilla, we'll talk to her. And so they grandfathered us in and we got to, and, and Bruce, you know, Sim Bruce Richards, everything was designed. So we just got to rebuild the way it exactly was. And they said, you should get this designated. And uh, I said, okay. And asked my, uh, I asked my friend, uh, Keith York, who you guys probably know, he's a mid-century nut and uh, it's a technical term. And uh, he said, Wendy Tinsley Becker. And I said, well, that's a good, that's a, three names, that's good. And she did everything. That's it. Okay, thank you. Um, Jessica and Everhart, would you like to go next? Well, um, we moved here from New York 10 years ago and we lived for, we rented at 464 Prospect because I was, you know, totally committed and Everhart wanted to test it out first. <laughs> <laughs> and we spent those two years looking for a house and very disappointed. We looked at, I don't know how many houses. And, but we we finally, Eberhard found this house actually because he was on the board of the California Western Law School and one of the professors at a board meeting, somebody, he, he was complaining about not being able to find a house and somebody said, well, one of our professors wants to sell their house. So he came and looked at it and that's how the whole thing happened. He said, you will love this house. And in fact, I did. So we bought the house actually directly from the, se the sellers and um, no brokers involved. And then, we went to a cocktail party. The, the guy who owned the apartment that we rented at 464, they had a cocktail party in Rancho Santa Fe. So we went to the cocktail party and I'm chatting away with this lovely woman named Lorraine Dyson. And she, I, I don't know how it came up, but we really had no idea who Henry Hester was when we bought the house. We really didn't. And we just loved the house. And then she, um, said, oh, my father built that house. So that started a whole bunch of conversations and she is a wonderful um, ambassador for her father. She really is. I mean, she adored him and she talks about him and she invited us to um, uh, sort of a retrospective of his work uh, somewhere north of here. I can't remember where exactly. 
and we couldn't make it. But so that got us started. And then um, Shona invited us to join her table at a historical society dinner at the um, Torrid Pines Lodge. And so it kind of snowballed from there. You know, we, we got interested in the architect. And then, of course, we got interested in the historical society. <laughs> and then Shona explained the process. And we started to look into it and we gave up because we thought we were told by a bunch of lawyers. I mean, I will disagree with Wendy about one thing. Don't try to do it on your own. It is hopeless. I mean, you need to use one of these experts here because they're, they, we talked to a few, and Jonathan is agreeing, I see. We talked to um, a lawyer, one of the um, lawyers, the real estate lawyer in my husband's firm put us in touch with someone who's supposedly an expert on this. So we talked to that lawyer and that lawyer said, oh, forget it. Anything under 45 years old, the only thing under 45 years old that ever got designated was the Salk Institute. It'll never happen. You're going to waste your money. Come back in 10 years. So we kind of gave up on it. And then Shona said, that's, I told her this story, she said, that's absolutely not true. And so uh, we worked with, with um, Sari and her husband and they were incredibly wonderful. They also did everything. We did absolutely nothing. Um, it takes a long time. I think Jennifer was brilliant in the way she wrote this. I mean, I was listening to her talking about the house and I was getting excited. I was thinking, oh my God, let's go look at that house. Maybe we want to buy it. And then I realized we live in it already. <laughs> so it was one of these, these things were just, we just loved everybody that we came in contact with. And the process was so smooth and we were celebrating. We didn't expect it to go. And we were just thrilled when it did. Great, thank you. Um, Jules and Paul. Um, uh, what would you like us to answer? What, what was the question? <laughs> the, the question is, why did you if decide to apply for a stork designation? Because <laughs> um, we love the house and um, we, although we want to live there the rest of our lives, we would never want to let anyone take it down. Um, we think it um, deploys so many great philosophies of Frank Lloyd Wright and organic architecture and to be able to kind of see it realized in um, sort of a spec respectful way to the time that he spent at Taliesin, but um, the way that Fred Witt puts his own touches on it, how meticulous it is. Um, Paul and I are both um, designers you know we have lots of thoughts lots of opinions and um one of my clients said um to us early on that um we found this house but this house found us and i think it's truly how we feel about the house that we're we're kind of in this journey together you know, I think as Jonathan says, it's like a wood boat and it needs lots of love. Um, I also compare it to buying a classic car. Um, so we, we really see, you know, our stewardship as to restore this, this classic car and enjoy it for what it is. And if you kind of stroll with it and drive with it, um, it's really just such a special place. And waking up there every morning, um, I think inspires us as designers in our, our own professions and our own styles. Um, but it's a meticulous house that loving hands put together inch by inch. And it's pretty cool to, to, to live in something like this. And so, um, I of think, course, it has to be designated. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, I, <laughs> no, I just think don't. that, like the fact that he, he designed it, he built it with his own hands. Okay. Um, if you look house. at the, yeah, if you look at all the details, I'm a craftsman as well, and it's just amazing to see how well it was put together. Um, and it's a time capsule, essentially. I mean, it's, it looks like it looks probably as close as it was to the. I mean, except for the exterior, maybe, which is the next job, but. Mm -hmm. The interior is in fantastic shape, mm -hmm. amazing. But with new life. So we, for example, in the spirit of kind of restoring an old car, 
when we bought the house, the, the cabinetry was a mess. None of the appliance worked. Um, the there's kitchen. mold in the dishwasher, all these, you know, yucky things. And um, we ripped the kitchen out and recreated it meticulously, inch by inch, every detail um, with new appliances and lit interiors and all the goodies that, you know, we like these days. But from the outside, it is, you know, every reveal and everything is perfectly recreated exactly as it was. And that's pretty much the only thing we've asked for. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, except for outside. So. <laughs> that's, did we answer the question? <laughs> yes, yes, thank you. That, that was great. Um, Jennifer, we have a question for you. Uh, the question is, do you know of any other Hester Holmes? Uh, this is from Jesslyn. She says he was a friend of ours during the 70s, and I can remember five homes he designed around La Jolla. So, yes, I will fully admit I'm not a Hester specialist or expert at all. Really, what interested me was tackling the postmodern significance and all of that. Harry might be better to, to discuss his catalog. It is a bunch of his projects are included in the designation report that we wrote for the house, which is available on the city's database. Um, then obviously modern San Diego, I think has a good list of his projects as well. Um, but I don't know if you have anything more to share, Sarah. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> um, yeah, Hester did quite a few residences in La Jolla and we do have a complete project list if you're interested um, in the report and the La Jolla Historical Society has a copy of it as well. Um, you can find it on CRID and um, the houses are named different things so I'm not sure if saying the addresses or you know just saying the names of the houses you would be able to recognize them but um, there's quite a few but they all predate this house. This was after he had retired and came back into commission for um, Helen so um, maybe we could follow up with that, sending you a project list. Very good, thank you. Um, we have another question here, and I think maybe I'll start with Shona and then open it up to our other specialists as well to see uh, if there are any other comments on this. The question is, what makes a master architect? Mm. I think there's an entire body of work that has to be demonstrated. Um, you know, the certification of the architect and then his body of work is 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 analyzed by by specialists. I, I, I imagine it's at the city level. I think the other specialists would know better than myself. But let me just mention the person that had a question about the Hester homes in La Jolla. And the specialists have mentioned the word CRID that uh, on the La Jolla historical website, Society website, there's a link for the landmark group. And in that, there's a PDF that, that describes, it's a resource for homeowners who want to have their house historically designated. And in that, there's a link to the city website where you can look up information on the architects and um, details of the architecture in La Jolla. So anyway, I'll pass it on to the specialists on becoming master architect. Sarah or <laughs> so um, Jack Carpenter, may I interview you? <laughs> Are you available this week? <laughs> he asked the question on the Q and A. Oh. Um, <laughs> so I think one of the um, a master architect has to be inducted when a project of theirs is being put forward for historic designation, and you compile their project list, and then you have to go through and analyze their work and their notable works. And so um, typically, you know, it's kind of a dead architects club, but we do have a couple of live architects that have been inducted, mm -hmm. including most recently, Jonathan Siegel. Um, Ken, Ken Kellogg, we were able to get him inducted last year. Other consultants had tried and did an excellent job, but the board mm -hmm. wasn't willing to do it at the time. And so we had to try, try again. Um, so I think that, there's not a set answer of what you have to do or what it makes to be a master. You just have to show quality of, you know, your designs, workmanship, your body of work, 
the time and era that you were um, designing houses or what type of buildings, commercial, industrial, and then, um, and then see if there's a project that is the best to put the master architect forward. Wendy, anything you want to add there? Yeah, sure. The definition of a master is actually derived from the National Register of Historic Places. And so I, I copied, Meg, I think I just sent it to you privately, but I um, pulled it up from National Register Bulletin 15. Um, so a master is a figure generally rec with generally recognized greatness in a field, a known craftsman of consummate skill, or an anonymous craftsman whose work is distinguishable from others by its characteristic style and quality. Uh, so that's something that I think these three architects that we've referenced in um, our presentations, you know, one, once you understand what the kind of character defining features of their work um, is, you can literally walk and drive around town and say that that is designed by that person that is designed by that person. Um, it, it, it becomes, um, you know, very, very noticeable. Um, to, to someone once you have that definition worked out. Um, so that alone, I think, is one indicator of a master or a potential master, someone who should be considered. You know, when you can kind of start to look at houses almost like, you know, baseball cards and say, oh, that's a Ruwako and, you know, that, that, that's a and that's a Liebhardt um, and that's a Hester. Um, that, that, that helps to kind of elevate those individuals without even giving them the official designation of master. Um, so that you don't always have to have a master who is prolific. You can have someone who maybe is attributed to, you know, five or 10 properties, but if those few properties that represent his work or her work, um, you know, are, are substantive and significant, um, then it may be that that person qualifies as a master. Um, conversely, you have someone like um, William Kessling, who um, Sari mentioned earlier. Um, we've asserted Kessling as someone who could be regarded as a master. I don't know if he's officially recognized. I, I think he's not, and it's kind of controversial locally um, amongst you know preservationists if, if he should be or not. Um, he, he was prolific in his work as a builder um, and, and unlicensed individual. Um, not every property is masterful, um, but there are certainly some Kesslings that are worthy of, um, you know, designation and that, that I think really culminate in him being recognized as a master. So you, you do have to kind of formulate the list and then look through the work and, and see how it all shakes out. But there is some guidance from the National Register of Historic Places to, to help with that. Great, thank you. Um, so Jonathan, there's been a, a few questions that have come in for you. Um, and I think you answered some of them in, uh, in your initial uh, discussion, but um, Someone asked uh, what it was like growing up in the Sim Bruce Richards home. And have you ever thought about selling your house? Oh, two good questions. Um, when you're a little kid, you don't know if things are weird. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, we eat pancakes three meals a day. And it was just like, we live in this giant wood and it's all about the wood and Jim Hubble is, you know, installing a, a, a piece of artwork. And I knew from the books, like Dick and Jane had a red house and the bedrooms were upstairs and, but there was snow. So, you know what I mean? But it, it just seemed like, oh, it's the sunset. Everybody stop. And, and, and it was just natural that it was pottery and art and we'd go down to, to Bruce's office and, and they, my mom and him would talk and my dad would come home and there'd be a, a, a earthen thing that my mom would have to explain why we needed this. And uh, it, it was just, I mean, it was just natural to me. And it was, I mean, I think of it, that house is my oldest memory. My parents are gone, I'm an only child. And I really think of it as like, a member of the family, it's like my sister. And uh, I don't know if other people have that affinity to a property. 
And um, it was it was weird because I have a one and a half year old grandson whose mission in life apparently is to is to kill himself. <laughs> so any any ledge or sharp or the fireplace is his friend, you know. So I don't know how I survived with those stairs and the and the and the deck because. Um, you know, in those days you didn't care. So it, it was unusual, but it was normal to me. And um, never even occurred to me that I would ever sell that house, except for one time, and this is a confession. When the Liebhart house, you guys, came on the market, yep, I wrapped my mind around I'm gonna sell this house and I'm gonna buy that Liebhardt house. Cause that was, you know, when I was a little kid, you know, you walk down there and you'd look at it. And I mean, I swear I've been in that house as much as you guys have. I brought contractors down from LA. <laughs> did I, you? I, I did, I did. I brought, I don't know how you did it. I'd love some time to talk to you guys about it. But that was, you know, cause I'm in love with that house, but. Uh -huh. <laughs> Great, I will do it. But that was the only time I've ever thought. And of course, now I, you know, I, I'm gonna spend more time in the house and be in La Jolla more. And it's, it's. Uh, but that was the that was the only time I've, it's ever occurred to me to to sell. Well, thank wow. you. That's a very very nice compliment. Congrat. Good job. <laughs> well, yeah. and that's a. <laughs> That's a great transition for the next question, um, which is for Jules and Paul. Uh, what is what are the favorite what are the favorite parts of the house for you? Um, I love to cook, so I love how the kitchen doors slide open into the courtyard, and I can constantly be connected to the outdoors in the courtyard. And then my other favorite thing, although it happens rarely in San Diego, but in the, the master bedroom, there's a, a deep eave over um, kind of a, a deck extension. And when it rains at night, I, we can open, you know, the kind of the sliding doors and you're just in nature and the sound of the rain on our roof that's like this thin. Um, you know, it just, you, you feel very kind of wrapped in nature and um, it's, it's a pretty cool, cool moment. What's your uh, favorite? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, I love the, of the, 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 the wood, all the woodworking, but I, what I actually really love is that, you know, we don't need air conditioning and the way that the house was designed, there's a lot of sliding windows um quarter, quarter inch pan <laughs> so not great for energy efficiency but um but you can you can really open the house and the breeze has come through so i think we had one day there that was uncomfortable but i mean other than that it's always been the air just the air, air, air circulation is great. great um the way the house is set up like we we really feel like we're alone um the way it goes with the topography um when you look down on it it just looks like it's kind of rolling off the hill um which I'd like to find out why, if, if that's maybe why the, some of the doorways are really low. <laughs> I'm not sure if it was just like you started and you went, oh, mm -hmm. the door is gonna be this tall. But um, luckily I fit under it. Yeah, our door heights and the original um, side of the house are only six feet tall, which for Paul yeah. and I is yeah. no problem. We don't think yeah. twice about it, but it my father is six foot three and he, <laughs> He keeps thinking Paul's going to craft these yeah. new door heights for him, but we don't dare touch them. <laughs> Very good. Um, so our next question uh, was commenting about how Jessica had talked about how the house being younger than 45 years, uh, but they were still able to get it designated. And I guess this question could be for for Jessica, for Jennifer, for Shona, um, what are the other attributes that might make a home eligible for designation um, in that, you know, in that 45 year time frame? I, I mean, I can take this. I, I think for us, 
the, the key shoe in really was the Hester connection because it was kind of at the end of his career. The majority of his career fell outside. Everybody was already, um, you know, aware of his contributions and he was a master architect. So, you know, the additional criteria that I loved about the house was obviously the architectural design. Um, I don't know how it would have gone if we just tried to rely on the architecture. So I think if you have, you know, a master builder, master architect, um, or, you know, there's some other additional criteria, it might be a little easier than just relying on the architecture. Um, that's one of the downsides, unfortunately. That 45 threshold, that's not a rule that you have to be 45 to be historic. That's just when the city starts automatically assessing for the historic importance and the idea is that there's been enough time to look back because you need distance. So if you're trying to go purely on architecture, um, it could be a little bit more of a challenge. Although, I mean, I think at this point, you know, the eighties are far enough away. I, you know, I think we do have enough distance that I think it, it you know, I, I was able to put together a pretty nice little package there about the postmodernism and, and the importance and that kind of a thing. So I think there is, it just really depends. Um, I know, you know, we recently had the Jonathan Siegel building designated, which is less than 10 years old. Um, you know, it had won a bunch of awards. So again, it reaches, you know, a threshold pretty easily. So I think that's kind of the key is you don't have to have exceptional importance. I just think it helps. Okay, great. Um, we've had two or three questions come in along the, the same line, which is, you know, how would I find out, and, and there were numerous architects listed, not just the ones we talked about today, but other ones as well. How would I find out uh, uh, for a certain architect what houses are designated in La Jolla? And Shona and Heath, I know you can answer this question for us. Uh, well, one uh, resource to look at is on the La Jolla Historical Society website, lahoyahistory.org. Under the drop down Historic La Jolla, there you will find a list of designated properties um, in the community of La Jolla. So that's a that's a quick, easy, good place to start if you're searching. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... And then we try to keep that up to date. I think the last time we updated it was 2019. But I think also, you know, several of the specialists have mentioned the CRID, which is the California Resource Inventory Designated Structures. I don't know exactly the definition, but there is a link that you can go to through the city and through the Historical Society where you can actually search for specific for the town for the the town to see what has been designated and the landmark group has a list of every house that's been designated in La Jolla. I just posted the link to it just for everyone's reference because I feel like that. Perfect. Great. Thank you Jennifer. That's great. Let's see and I think we have one last question here um, and this is for Jessica and Eberhard and uh, how much did the Helen Copley connection play into your interest in the property and purchasing the property? Um, well, yeah. I don't think at all, actually, because she, I think what appealed to us was that she, really she was the only owner. I mean, there was actually, that's not true. There was somebody who bought it from the Copley estate and they held on to it for a couple of years, but I don't think they ever lived here. They they fixed it up and then they, you know, they basically flipped it to us, the very nice people who do that, have done that a lot. And um, I can say that the house is amazingly well built. I mean, we've owned multiple houses in different locations in the United States and Eberhard's father was an architect. I forgot to mention that. And so, um, you know, he's got a great eye and also an understanding of all of that. And the house is just so well built. I mean, it's nothing's falling apart. It's quiet. It's solid. It's, um, it's just a pleasure. So I think that, that Mrs. Copley probably had a lot to do with that. She didn't cut corners was my impression. She, you know, she had deep pockets and therefore wanted to do things right. So that's a good thing. Um, I did want to mention one other thing is I learned something as I always do when I listen to these things um, that 
modern architects, somebody said this, had, that one of their qualities is that they design things for the house, you know, furniture oh, or, yeah. I thought that was interesting because we have here this gorgeous dining room table that he built for the house and for the space. And there's a cupola over the dining room table, the exact same size as the table that has um, where you, it's acoustically, you know, somehow designed that you can hear somebody who's sitting right across the t very big table as if they're sitting next to you. And I thought that, that level, that detail that kind of level of detail. And I don't think it's, a, it's um, there's a deed restriction that you have to keep the, the table with the house, but we think of it like that. We would never remove that table from this house and it's a beautiful table. Wonderful, thank you. <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a dining room table and a, and a couch that uh, Bruce Richards designed for, for, for our house. Oh. That we still have, and the fireplaces. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. And we love the, the high ceilings in this house. It's, um, they're really, I don't know how high are they? What do you think? 10 feet. 10 feet. And it's, a, it's just a fantastic detail. Very large rooms and very high ceilings. Feels um, <clears throat> almost Venetian. <laughs> um, any last thoughts or comments from our homeowners? or our specialist before I hand it back over to Heath. Um, we wanted to say thank you to Sari for the awesome, awesome job that she did. Um, thank you. We thought about maybe doing it ourselves and there is no way. <laughs> and she was like this beautiful angel taking us through and really a rock star to work with. She made it very easy and um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, now I've got to thank Wendy because <laughs> it's true. I mean, I, I can rest assured that the house is, is preserved and, and, and taken care of. And, uh, you know, she would say, I'm going to do this. And I would say, good job. Keep me posted. And uh, and now I got a big plaque and I'm talking to all of you guys. So it's a, yeah. it's a beautiful thing. Well, I've got to thank Jennifer then, because even though we worked with Sari, Jennifer did a lot of that, that heavy lifting, so to speak, yeah. all the research and the writing, and she did a fantastic job. I mean, when I heard her talk about the neo-Mansard style, I was really... <laughs> <laughs> no, I, thank you guys, because it's so unique. It, you know, I love Spanish. I love Tudor. I really do. But we, you know, there's a lot of them, right? So it's, it, it, you're kind of familiar with it. So it's to get to delve into this realm, you know, it was almost like being back in architecture school where I got to go through my textbooks, you know, and I'm yeah. with, with all this information because it's kind of, I was doing it from scratch because yeah, right. don't get to talk about it. So anybody else, if you have a property less than 45 years, don't rule it out. Let's look into it, you know, <laughs> let's see what we can find. And, and, and we thank you all for your participation because Really, it's wonderful to share this information and for the owners to share and to have it documented for history because now you're, you're, you're all documented, which we love. Thank you all. Do you want, do you want to mention that Fritz is Fritz? Do we want to mention that Fritz is on this? No. So, so the children, I guess some of the children of the Leaphearts are watching. Yeah. Tonight, yeah. Which is wonderful. Hey, Fritz. And, and, and there, hi, call us. Come over. <laughs> we want to be your cousins. <laughs> oh, great. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Well, Heath, I will turn it over to you to close us out for the evening. Okay, thank you, Meg. And I want to add my word of thanks on behalf of the Historical Society to all of you who have participated uh, in this webinar this evening. The presentations were terrific and we really appreciate uh, having the homeowners involved with the architectural historians in the discussion. I also wanna express our appreciation to Meg Davis for producing these webinars and a special word of thanks to Shona MacArthur for curating and organizing uh, these presentations. Uh, and many thanks to all of you, our guests who have attended this. Uh, we hope you found it interesting 
and informative. And I should note that both of the webinars in this series will be available on the La Jolla Historical Society YouTube site and on our website at lajoyahistory.org. Thanks to all of you again for joining us and have a great evening. Bye-bye.